Hello, I'm Kriakos Gold and welcome to Think Greek. Join me in this episode to talk about the women of the revolution with Vicky Papachristos and Faye Spiteri. trying to get a board position these days, they're all going to the women, and I know that's rubbish. I'm not, um, you know, a woman of colour, or an Asian woman, or, you know, identity, like, I'm, you know, you fit a particular thing. Does, is that bother me? No. It really makes me want to shrink back and go, how have I contributed to that behaviour, and what have I done to change that behaviour? I think around the world, even for the people that they came here in Australia as uh, for a better life. They were looking for opportunities. So I think it's a very important work. Multiculturalism was built uh, with the premise of a, a utopia. I think it's cool to be Greek today. Yasas, I'm Kyriakos Gold and this is Think Greek. Today we're talking about the women of the revolution and today I have with me Vicky Papachristos and Faye Spiteri. We spoke about women yesterday briefly. We're not going to go through the whole history of the revolution, but what we took from last night was that women were commodities. They were invisible, they were traded like slaves. However, some of them excelled. They were never recognized in the new Greek state. They were recognized later. Let's see what Din Kalimniu said about women of the revolution in our first episode. Bobulina and Mavrogenos were two women who were lionized by the Greek community and by, the, by Greek historiography and were treated deplorably. Bobulina was assassinated because her son had the temerity to uh, marry the, um, the daughter of a leading land baron on the island of Hydra. Mando Mavrogenos has uh, devoted all of her family resources to equipping ships for the Greek Revolution. Her love life was uh, paraded um, for all to see, she was, uh, it was, I'll call it, she was slut shamed. Yeah. How do you feel 200 years later? Do you feel women are celebrated now in Greece? Do you still, do we need a revolution? What do you think? I'll probably always need a revolution. Um, and I don't know that they are celebrated as much as they should be. And there are some that are celebrated, like if you look back into the more recent past, we've had some extraordinary actors and musicians that are hugely celebrated, but they were hugely successful as well, like Maria Callas, Melina Mercuri, um, Nana Muscuri, you know, she's known globally. She sings in 15 different languages. So they have been celebrated, but have, uh, are there are many more. And from the revolution, there's only a few that I could talk about and, or would know about. So um, I don't think they have been celebrated. Faye? I agree. Um, and I suppose it's, you know, that confluence of um, understanding who the heroes of that war of independence were. Um, and if you look back at the history of the women that are recognised, it's very much um, women who were wealthy, um, independent in their own right to some degree, especially for that time and place. How that's, and I guess it's the, um, you know, when you reflect on history, it's always um, about the perception of the people writing that history. And you mentioned, um, you know, the history of the First Nations people of Australia uh, and growing up, you know, what did we learn about that history? And I think it's the same with the women of um, the revolution and their history. It's who wrote that history and what details you know, were recorded for that history to be recorded. And then that second part of your question, how does that translate to Greece today or Greek Australian women today? And I think there are things you inherit um, consciously, subconsciously around the boldness of the bravery and courage and passion of women to create change. Are there women who are standouts? Yes, there always are. How you describe them in terms of their bravery and heroes, 
I think, always depends on who's telling the story. So I think you can take famous women um, because we know their stories and they become examples and heroes for the everyday woman who I believe are the real heroes because they are the ones that are committed every day to making a difference and making change, but they're inspired by you know, what they um, hear and see and, and read of women of, um, you know, the, that have come before and the legacy that, that they've created. So, the story of the graph on the the winner takes it all. Yes, I think so. I think so. I think it's, I mean, it's, you see it, like I mentioned, with our own history and, and what does that mean? And it's all about um, perception and facts because facts in whose eyes? You know, facts in how, you know, and you see a lot of um, history that is being rewritten, like the Black Lives Matters um, movement in America. That's all about rewriting that history from the perception of the lived experience of people who have been oppressed or, you know, victims. And I think in this case, it's the same. The women who fought for independence were very um, brave and their stories weren't necessarily, you know, recorded in the way that potentially, you know, the male stories were or the hero, the male heroes, but I don't think they ever are because it's, you know, who holds the pen, you know, who, who is writing those stories and you, throughout society and even to today, obviously, we have great gender inequality and great um, gender imbalance. It doesn't mean women can't raise their voice and obviously it's happening more and more, but I think everything is cyclical. So you reach points of at which, um, for example, like in the 70s, where women, you know, really um, fought for women's rights and liberties on a whole range of issues and the freedoms of which we enjoy today. I'm going to go uh, a step back. So the, the wealthier women had the option to educate themselves and maybe contribute till they got married. The poorer women were, were nothing. They were invisible. Does that happen today as well? Does money oh, matter? Of course it does. Yeah. It, it does in different ways. And it's not just the Greek women, it's a lot of the women. Um, I spent a lot of time mentoring young women from my old high school. And these days, back then, we're all the, the Greeks and the Jews. And today's they're, uh, they're all, you know, the young Asian women. They're all Australian. In the main, they're Australian born, but they're very different in culture. And so they, they're very, they're just their culture is much more quiet than we were as Greek women. I think we had a, a much bigger voice. Our mothers taught us to have a voice and they, uh, th they are quieter. Also, when I speak to some of the girls, I, I were talking before about cycling. I might go for a bike ride and I'll chat to one of the girls and say, what do you do? Where do you work? And then my next question will be to them, when are you going to be the CEO? And they'll either go, oh, no, I'm not going to be the CEO. I don't want that much responsibility. Or they'll giggle and they'll say, well, I don't know. So that then becomes a door for the, them to, to open for them to say, well, start looking at being the CEO because, you, and you give them permission, you start to talk to them about, well, there's no reason you shouldn't be. You've got the skills, you've got the capabilities you've you've got the passion so it's about letting them open that door to go to that place where they can become the CEOs. I come from the corporate world so that's my passion and helping the women have find their voice and be non-invisible so to speak so but it's very hard and uh, there's a there was a recent TV series on with in the pol with the politicians and there's one particular scene where they all talk about being in a room full of guys and saying something and nobody hears them. It's um, an unconscious bias in some ways, but it's also a, there's just not that security, I put it down to amongst the guys to say, we can listen to this and we can take it on. And I've been in a room full of, in a boardroom with a, my co-board directors and said something and there was peace and quiet for about two minutes. And then one of the other guys said exactly the same thing in exactly the same words as I said. And I kind of looked at him and thought, I even was a bit cheeky and turned around and winked at him and said, 
I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> and he looked at me like, oh my God, what are you talking about, woman? And it was intense. It was just so frustrating. And so what do you do in that situation? Do you find your voice and say, stamp your hand on the table and say, I just said that, but you won't get anywhere with that because they, they haven't heard you, you haven't been heard. So yes, we are still invisible in many ways, but no, there are in, non-invisibilities happening as well, so. Why do you think you grew up with a bigger voice than your, than your Australian friends? Does cultural, does cultural identity have anything to do with that? Yes, for me it does, personally for me it does. Um, I have a classic story where my mum would introduce me and my brother and she'd say, he's my son, he doctor. <laughs> <laughs> he's my daughter, she not married. <laughs> right? you know, I took a while to get on with it, right? Not that it mattered, but, and so, <laughs> I would always have to fight for everything I wanted to do. My brother was allowed to go out, do anything he wanted, but I was the good Greek girl, had to stay at home and do the right thing, learn how to sew, knit, crochet, cook and study, get degrees, because that way you get a better quality of husband. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's very flippant in the way I'm describing, but it's actually quite true. That's uh, probably how I found I had a, bit of a, a bigger voice than... Um, some of my contemporaries. We're not historians here, we're just going to assume. Why do you think the women of the revolution got out there and fought? They sold the ships, they sold the houses to empower the soldiers. What would make a woman that is traditionally invisible in, under an empire, the Ottoman Empire at the time, to just put herself out there? They knew that they were not going to get recognised, I'm certain. Well, I, I don't think if you're passionate and brave and courageous, I don't think you do anything because you want recognition. You do it because you believe in change. I, I think those women fought for change because they, they had the power and the capacity because a lot of them that are well recognised um, you know, were, were from wealthy families. So they had the money. They may have died poor and penniless um, or stateless even, but you know, they, f they put everything they had into that fight for the freedoms of their compatriots and also their country, so believing in those um, freedoms. And I think, like um, Vicky was saying, I think we all, uh, you know, fight that good fight in as far as we can, whether in a boardroom, whether um, through education, whether championing other women, whether in the workplace, because it's really important to encourage others to find their voice. And I think that that's what they, they did. And, oh, sorry, just because, I, and I believe, because, you know, that whole idea that they're somehow homogenous isn't true. And I think that that's the, the myth of that history, that women were fiercely independent, minds of their own, and able, they may not have had the trappings that, you know, male colleagues may have had, but, in terms of the recognition, but they certainly had the intelligence to be able to make things um, happen and to live the, their lives like um, Manto Mavrogenos, who I believe yes. lived with her partner for many years. So, you know, led the way very, very early on. Why do we care about the women of the revolution? Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna grab that sentence and throw it at you. <laughs> because they were trailblazers, because they, had courage, they were brave enough to make a difference and they had the wherewithal to do it or they created the wherewithal. And they, we care because they did help make that difference. And we have to care because it shows us, it gives us role models. This is some of the things that I talk about. Um, there are very few women as CEOs in Australia and well, worldwide actually, how, how come? Because, well, we don't have role models there to go and be, to look forward, look at those women and say there, uh, I want to be like her. I want to, um, I, I, I see her and I can do it as well. And you need courage to step out from the comfort space. You need someone to have your, their hand on your back to keep holding you forward 
and saying to you, you can do it. And they're the kind of conversations that I have with some of the young women, or they're not young all the time, they're even older, and to give them courage and to give them the permission. I'm a great believer, you give permission to someone to do something. Yes, you can go and do that. And they, the, the women of the independence, they didn't need the permission, they took it. They had it, they took it, they took a risk, of course, and many of them, as Faye was saying, died in poverty and they gave up everything because they had nothing else to lose, really. I want to go to the audience. Barbara, you're the, you, at the moment, you're the collective voice of women in the community. You are, you've just written a book called Her Voice and you've interviewed many prominent women. Firstly, how did you feel growing up as a Greek Australian woman? What was your connection with the revolution? And then, if you can tell us the result of your book, <laughs> so <laughs> we can go and read it after. <laughs> well, I didn't grow up here to start off with. I grew up in Greece and I came to Australia as soon as graduated from high school. So uh, my recollection of the Greek revolution and the history is through the textbooks and we only learned about uh, Bubulina and Mantol Mavrogenos, they were the two women. Uh, of course, coming from Epiros, I've always known about the Suliotises because my yaya was from Suli, okay? And then the Mesolongitises. Uh, if I can just go back to the women of the revolution, it was an era that women were not celebrated. It was an era that it was male dominated and the role of women were to help their families, the husbands. And there were all those women that helped and sold their houses, they were very uh, privileged women. They had money, so they've sold everything. And history has done them a disservice. And I'm thinking of Mandoma Vrogenos, who really, uh, she's done really badly. Uh, Vicky talked about the uh, unconscious biases and what happens when she mentors women, right? And you're very lucky that you had a voice because my mother uh, told me that I shouldn't talk about myself, I shouldn't brag, and I've mm. still have got this voice in my head saying, let others speak about you. And in some of the other cultures, like the Asian cultures, um, women do not talk about themselves, and this Western culture doesn't sit well with the, their upbringing. Now, uh, the question you ask, are women celebrated, is probably the wrong question. May I? What is the I'll tell you question? why. I think um, the question that we should be asking is, are culturally and linguistically diverse women or indigenous women equally represented in positions of power? And the answer is no. So they were not represented back then and they're not represented And they're not represented. So things are changed. a lot better. Oh, things so are, things are better? Yeah, things are better, in but we're way? not there yet. And that's what I'm saying in my book. Now, the stories, um, uh, the women that I've selected um, to be represented in the book, the book is called Her Voice, Greek Women and Their Friends. I've interviewed about 50 different women and um, I've applied the diversity lens and I try to pick up women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s um, from all professions, business world, um, as much intersectionality as one could have in a single publication. Gay women, single women, women that I've um, brought up with. Um, so what is that you observed that was common throughout? A lot of racism, system? sexism, but despite all of that, the resilience of them and uh, the will to succeed has helped them to move on. But they've had to work a lot harder because apart from the gender glass ceiling, they've had another, the cultural glass ceiling. Some of those women are here, by the way, in the book. Vasu is in the book. Esther is in the book. <laughs> so so we, we reached out to the right people. Yeah. Vasu, can I ask you a question? Uh, you're, you're known around the world. You've done some tr tremendous things, not just for the community, for, for everyone. Do you think you've been celebrated enough by our community? Yes and no. I mean, there's been um, a lot of jealousy, a lot of hatred to get where I am. I mean, there's half the population hate me, half the population like me, and I don't know why they hate me. Well, they don't even know me. I don't even know them. <laughs> but they hate me. So I think people judge, and they, they just have this picture of you, and they judge you. 
and they either like you or hate you. Unfortunately, I see a lot of this hatred and jealousy from women, from fellow, like, women. I mean, they, you know, you, they, they're not happy for your success. You know, oh, there she goes again, she got another award or whatever. You know, and they just hate it. I mean, it. you've only cured cancer. <laughs> 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 um, but so that's the bad, but then with the bad comes the good, and, you know, there is recognition, there is, you know, I've got you know, 100 awards and whatever, so people are recognising what I'm doing, scientific community, general public, etc. When you were growing up, did you, um, did you connect with the women of the revolution? Was that something that was not on your radar? Did no. you feel that there were role models for you in Greek history? Um, well, when we learned about, you know, 1821, it was Kolkotroni. I didn't know anybody else, like I didn't know any females. Any female in the revolution, I, I mean, I don't know. Um, that's what we learned at Greek school. So that's, that's all I learned. Um, uh, role models, yeah, actually, most of my role models and were males, you know, and even my, I've got you know, mentors, um, they're males. So I've connected better with males as role models and as mentors. And even now I have mentors and it's a male, not the females are just fine and just, I don't know why, I mean, there's, Jealousy, I'm not sure what it is. I think it's a lack of experience. It's a lack of um, what I was saying before about being there, practicing it, getting to getting away from the unconscious bias, getting to a, not even a conscious bias, but in, to a rhythm, having the ability to do that all the time. To, for us to be there, to engage with them and, and it's interesting, I've got a conversation going on at the moment with some of my girlfriends who I've met through one of the things I've been involved in. We were talking about this before, it's at Scale Investors, which is a female-led angel investment group where we only invest in female entrepreneurs. We have scale males as well as we call them. And what we do there is we've become friends, we've become collaborators, we've become uh, we talk to each other. I had a couple of a phone call on the weekend from someone who most situations that uh, in a kind of workspace, you don't expect your colleagues to call you on the weekend, but we're not colleagues anymore. We've probably never been colleagues. So it's about having that community of friends and female friends that and getting past that jealousy thing, getting past that um, oh, she's doing better than me or whatever. And it's celebrating. And I think this is coming back to, it's not that they weren't celebrated, it's just that they weren't known. And I think the stories weren't available and the men have led the world pretty much most of the time. And that's what people like to hear. That's what they like to talk about. But there's some fantastic things happening. Like one of the things is in sport, cricket, the women's cricket is being played and they're getting paid and there's some a lot of talk about how much they're getting paid so that equality thing is really important and calling that out and I think we're finding the opportunity for more conversations around well why isn't that happening and part of the reason scale investors came about was with some leading Victorian uh, women uh, was to help these young entrepreneurs get funding where they've never been, you know, about 4% of funding goes to women. So it's about changing that and the government is getting behind that. It's a, it's a slow process, but it's working, it's happening. We, um, we invest in about oh, 10 to 15 businesses a year and, and it varies, I won't go on about it, but it's, um, it, the, I think there's a change happening. So there's a lot of work to do. Because I think it's interesting when you talk about mentors and um, you know, who you consider your mentors. And I guess in my life, um, you know, I've had both male and female, um, both professionally. Yes. So, you know, Vula Mary, um, who most of you would know, has been an incredible mentor to me, you know, since, um, uh, you know, when I began um, my career. And likewise, um, you know, males in, in the sector that I grew up in, which is in the um, public um, but social um, sector and then when I moved into corporate the same championed by um, a lot of um, you know great mostly men because they were the ones in the corporate sector and I was part of the Cleminger group and yeah. like you said you're in a, a boardroom with 12 men and there's you 
and I guess um, what was interesting, what had led me to that point was a lot of desire to make a difference, but naivety to the degree that if I reflect back now and think what pushed me to be in those rooms or in that space was um, a, a little bit of chutzpah, but a, a little bit of ignorance too, because I didn't know what I didn't know. And I was there to learn and to do good work. And I was championed by really great people, but I worked really hard you know, at each stage to get to the next stage. Um, but I think the birth of that came from my mother and my aunt, who were amazing, but my grandmothers before them. So my, both my paternal and maternal grandmothers were refugees um, from Asia Minor. Um, they were orphaned at 12 and 13 years old. But they still went on, they were resettled and they were moved again. It's a very common story. I'm sure most of you, you know, share that story in terms of, um, you know, your, um, your families. But what inspired me, even as a child, um, knowing their stories, was that despite everything, they got married, they had families, they raised um, amazing daughters, their daughters raised more daughters. <laughs> Um, but all with the attitude that you could be or do whatever you wanted to do. But you also... Mine was different. Yeah, so which is a really uh, interesting experience. Yeah. It's, it's because you're not married. Yeah. Oh, you were not... Right. <laughs> forgot. But even to be, I mean, I think you still had those cultural expectations, but there was also the expectation, you know, that you would be very well educated, that you would be successful to whatever degree you know, that was measured, which I think when you look around this room, but generally in the Greek community, when you talk about what is the legacy we've inherited from the women of the revolution, I think it's that, that you can pave the way, you can pave your own way. It takes courage, it takes bravery, because success does not come easily. You hear it all the time of actors where they're told, oh, you know, you overnight success and there's no such thing, right? We all know that. But it's that, I think, and, and I've said this before in other forums, it's backing yourself of saying, I'm going to do this. I know it's, the journey is hard, the path is hard, being on boards likewise, but you carve a space for yourself. So I always say that I had a um, corporate mind but a social heart. So I've always worked in roles that um, combine the two, where you bring a corporate business lens to the work that you do, but it has a social outcome um, for social good because that, that was my passion. And I've been able to have the opportunities, you know, throughout my career that have led me now to have the privilege of being the CEO at Fundida Care. But that was a long time in the making um, and, you know, because again, I had the privilege of being the first female um, president of Flundida Care in a 40, well, at that time, it was a 35 year history, which is phenomenal. But my view was, well, at least it happened. At least it <laughs> happened, right? Like, yeah. I, I'm just gonna go back to what you yeah. said about your grandmothers. Uh, and it, it just, I thought that came yeah. to me. Did you ever consider that they were women of the revolution? I mean, they were very close to the struggle for liberation. Yeah. It was the aftermath of well, that. Well, I'm born and raised in Melbourne, born and raised. I met my grandmothers um, one once um, on a trip back to Greece, you know, the six month holiday, obligatory in the 70s, you know. Um, spent a whole, you know, um, a couple of seasons there. Um, met her briefly, Oh, not briefly, met her, you know, met one of them and the other one twice, but, you know, again, on, on holiday before they passed away. I guess to me, I didn't think in those grand big terms. I just thought this is incredible that in one generation, all two, two generations, the privilege that I have coming from, you know, that I enjoy with the opportunities that I have had because of the sacrifices of my grandmothers and their, you know, their families, their experience, but my parents too, and my mother, um, you know, in particular. So I think it's, again, 
you know, it's how do you measure these successes? How do you measure the, like, the glory of that contribution? And I think it's what Vassal was saying before, you know, you can get the accolades, you can get the awards, you can get the positions and the titles. Is that what matters? Because is that your motivation? I'm sure it was never Vassal's motivation. It's nice. It's nice to have it. It's nice to have your peers, recognition of your peers. It's nice to have, um, you know, recognition of your colleagues or your mentors or your community. You know, it's really, um, it's humbling. But I know from myself when I've had that kind of recognition or awards, so it's, it, it's, it's important in that it gives you a certain gravitas. But is that why I did what I did? Never. Let's talk about multiculturalism. What was it that made the Greeks revolt? Oh, they wanted their country back. Mm -hmm. They wanted uh, identity for the place they were living at. If we had to talk about multiculturalism here in the same terms, the closest I think we could come to would be the indigenous community because, and they don't have the aggression that the Greeks had during the independence period. So it'd be interesting if we get to that, but I doubt it, that we live in a very different world. But I think the Greeks did want their country back. And so they, they had a deep desire to be connected, but they still had a lot of their infighting. Remember, we had the civil wars and a lot of those sorts of things. And so that's a micro um, multiculturalism at its best in many ways. It always shocks me that I'm a child of migrants, that I even learn how to read and write, let alone to get to that level like that. And I'm not kidding. I used to say it all, my, all think it all the time, you know, how you got to go from that story of people who came with nothing to build a better life to one of the most successful generations of migrants to Australia with real power in our community. Um, I think, I, I don't know yeah. if I've shared this story before, but uh, when I worked at Premier and Cabinet, um, and this was back in the early 2000s, and I worked on the Racial Religious Tolerance Act introduction, and um, uh, you know, under Premier Brax at the time, and John Pandesopoulos was minister assisting. So, you know, it was kind of the glory days of multicultural affairs. And I always thought that um, it was the Jewish community that was the powerful or the Italian community. And I was, you know, really surprised to find that it was actually the Greek community that was behind a lot of change. Now, and I think, again, it goes back to that idea that we have inherited something in our DNA which just drives us above and beyond many other um, uh, culturally um, connected, culturally ethnic groups. Why do you think why Australian multiculturalism works today? Um, I think that's a really interesting question because I, I, I think it works for a number of reasons um, and that is the policy framework around it. Um, I don't know that it works today, right? So I'm not sure how it is working today because I think what I mentioned before, everything is a cycle. I think at this point in time, in terms of leadership um, around social cohesion, uh, in terms of policy around um, diversity and what that means for a multicultural society, um, I, th I think I'm not sure that it works as well as maybe when I became interested um, in this area and worked in policy and um, worked, you know, in advocacy and those that went before me who really lobbied for change and created this pathway that, you know, we now enjoy. I'm not sure that the structures and systems that were um, uh, put in place in the 70s and 80s through federal state um, uh, uh, politicians and leadership and then policies and then services and programs that flow from from that it's different i don't know that it's in some ways as good i think because the nature of our society is constantly changing i think the dialectic around it got um hijacked by an us and them conversation rather than an us conversation 
uh, I did a lot of work when I was at the Cleminger Group on social cohesion, um, and this was probably six, seven years ago, and you could see the fracture in society um, of people who were very pro um, multiculturalism and immigration and refugees and felt an obligation to support diversity in our community. So that tear in the social mm. fabric, mm. is it the same that it was 200 years ago or was it poverty that made that more intense? Well, I think the, any, the factors that create um, impetus for change and revolution, I think are fundamentally the same. Their core um, issues of identity, of fighting for freedom, of fighting for independence, of yep. you know fighting for basic human rights. Like they fight for human rights, and today's fight around multiculturalism is very much around people's um, human rights and and rights to exist in context of what they identify with. On in collaboratively in a society. So I think it's. Um, and, and Vicky mentioned it, you know, we've seen the rise of the voice of First Nations people. Um, they have a very different character, if you like, around their polemic. And I think what makes, you know, communities like the Greek community different or, or you know, the Italian or the European communities different is that we had a stronger sense of self and identity because we weren't nomads. Right? And we, we fought for place, we fought for country. I mean, I'm sure we've all been on planes back to Greece where people kiss the ground as soon as they come out because they're <laughs> so happy, you know, to have come back home or likewise to Australia or wherever. You know, so it's, I think that, you know, I, I don't think we live in an experiment anymore around multiculturalism. I think it's a fact. That is who we are. We see the impacts of COVID and locked borders on on um, workforce. You can't survive without migration, right? So by virtue of the fact that you, Australia needs population and we're not producing it here, um, naturally, <laughs> you know, you have to bring it in. It's now, a whole new conversation. Those, who those people are that want to call Australia home because they see it as an opportunity, you know, is different to who it was in generations past, but their desire to call um, another place home comes from that, I think, desire of what I described before in my grandparents and parents um, around a better life. I just want to go back to the, um, the question of multiculturalism and uh, Australia's First Nations because I think the, um, you know, multiculturalism is the norm. Monoculturalism is what people who are threatened by cultural diversity try to reinstate. And so the revolution was a time of having a particular kind of culture which was oppressive for all sorts of people, uh, you know, in power for, for quite some time. And then this, you know, moment of fracturing, and we'll talk a lot about the, the culture of that, of that soon. Um, but when we think about Australia's First Nations, this was a multicultural continent since time immemorial. There are hundreds of First Nations. Uh, we are here on the lands of the Bunwurrung, the Bunurong, and the Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people. Uh, this is Melbourne contested land. Um, there, are, there have been all sorts of, I guess, myths and sometimes misconceptions because we haven't, uh, and many of our generations and older than us, you know, we haven't all uh, been educated and listened to elders. So there is a pervasive misconception about nomadic cultures. Mm. That First Nations people are not nomadic. They have extremely deep connections to country, which is something that we, we can all learn from. Um, there's often a misperception around uh, aggression or not being aggressive, um, uh, just like any other culture. There are there are aggressive First Nations groups. There are there are uh, you know calm and quiet. There are creative. There are uh, there was all sorts of resistance to the culture to, to, to the frontier wars, and a lot of those stories aren't being told as well. So when when we reflect on uh, Australia's First Nations, I think. Um, it's kind of, it's not about us putting our multiculture um, or our Greek culture alongside that or making that comparison, but this is the foundation uh, of Australia's multiculturalism. Um, and so when we talk about women and, and the revolution there, I think, um, um, I think it was uh, possibly, was it Faye or Vicky who said that you know, the, the language of multicultural, it's all been co-opted different times, all, all of Faye's policy work. Um, 
Absolutely. I think multiculturalism, cultural diversity, it's language that's sometimes used in a failed attempt, it will continue to fail, in an attempt to, you know, sideline and marginalise multiculturalism, which is always already mainstream. It is the strength that we have. And when we talk about, you know, others othering us, um, they are in the position that is going to fail, not us. And I just want to add to that as well, because I'm learning as well. Well, there's so much lost history that we have as yeah. settlers here in this country. Yes. And that's a shared lost history. Yes. And I've only learnt recently about the frontier wars and the, the deep roots that people had mm. here and the mm. 400 nations that we've come here to, to learn about. So um, it, it is multiculturalism was built uh, with the premise of a, a utopia. And it has been not only co-opted, but it's been uh, vandalised yes. as well recently. And whether it's through political aspirations and deep, deep racism, um, that it's something that we need to take back somehow. And as settlers, particularly with coming from our parents with a refugee background, um, I think there's an opportunity for us to reflect and learn and First Nations first, absolutely. Because yes. remember, this is a country that was colonised and built on genocide. And going back to the women of the Greek Revolution, they, experienced, they may have been wealthy, but they saw oppression. They saw everything from culture taken away from them. They saw atrocities and they dealt with um, the, the horror of war and oppression. So that gives people their fighting spirit and we absolutely see that. Yeah. For the women in this room, I guess, we've got that, <laughs> that spirit within us but also absolutely within uh, First Nations and the matriarchy that we mm. see and the, mm. the leaders that I'm so inspired to know and, and learn from in my older years. I'll be 60 next year. So this is the time where I'm educating myself. <laughs> and on that theme of multiculturalism, absolutely loved what you guys said. Mm -hmm. And it's really, and it's when we apply that myopic interpretation of what we believe multiculturalism is, then we get into trouble. Uh, we then impose our in interpretation, which might, might be not as inclusive as what it should be. And I think Again, within the classroom, I've got you know, uh, post, uh, I've got um, students that are school age students. I've got mature age students. I've got students that are international that really can't speak much English, and I try and and, and um, encourage each of them to work cooperatively, and it seems to work. Vicky, you said oppression. If oppression is the foundation of revolution, are women? the key to revolution. Women are the biggest part of our society that are literally yeah, oppressed. About 52% of so the population many parts of the world. are female. And yeah, they are oppressed. And to extend to uh, the conversation around the multiculturalism, when our parents, I think most of us, our parents first came to Australia, we had, uh, we had little groups of people. And I remember when other cultures were moving in, my mum would say, what do they want here in our country? <laughs> and it was like, well, mum, you know, you're a foreigner. No, no, I'm not, I'm Australian. And in her best Greek, not even in her best English. And so to go back to the oppression question about are women oppressed? In many ways they are. I have conversations, my husband is the biggest uh, detractor of feminism or, you know, progression of women that you could find. So uh, he says to me all the time, you've got such a chip on your shoulder. And I say, no, I don't. I have, I'm very well balanced. I have a chip on each shoulder. <laughs> I'm very good. But he, he says, he, he, does, he says, forget about any man trying to get a board position these days. They're all going to the women. And I know that's rubbish because I've seen it in play. I see it. So there's all these other things that come into play about the, you know, this is talking to your oppression, right? That is, for a female to get on a board these days, she has to have the exact skills that's on that job description that she's been talked to, that she's been interviewed for, and then everything else. Some of those things are definitely changing. And what's also happening is, personally, or 
personally for me, but also amongst my contemporaries, we're finding our um, comfort. We're losing, or at times, losing that imposter syndrome where I had someone say to me the other, my husband said to me the other day, you have no idea about finance. I said, I have a big idea about finance, but I don't have a minor idea about finance. I have a big idea about everything else. And I'm never hired on boards to be the finance guru. That is not what my skill set is. That is not where I grew up, but I do have to have some mainstream capability. So there, and I'm getting into fine, fine uh, space of, you know, the oppression in, because that's the place I know, the corporate space. And there's, the women are not getting selected because there's this big um, influx of conversation around we have to have a women, women on boards. Yes, they are going there and the skill sets are there, but what's missing a lot of the time is that acute experience. So there's a lot of work to do to see, get back to you know what we were talking about before, having the role models, having uh, experience, having mentors, having people open the doors for you, having those conversations. Can I, can I ask your opinion? Do you think there are two buckets of white women and women of color? Just like in, back in the revolution, we had rich women and poorer women. Is that the case? We read a lot about that. What is your personal experience? It, there is, but that's shifting as well. That is definitely shifting. Uh, I meet a lot of women that want to chat, you know, get guidance, and they're not white, blonde, Anglo-Saxon types um, at all. They are there too. And some of them, my best friends are like that as well. And because that's who they are. I mean, you know, the other thing is we don't get up as a woman. I don't get up every day and go, oh, I'm a woman. And there's a particular way I have to behave today when I go to work, when I go to um, the gym or uh, the supermarket or uh, at home. That's, we're a person. So this is the whole part of it that's, you know, that, that, I've lived with an, un, with an unconscious bias all my life where I'm, I'm me. And so why do I get labelled as a woman? Because that's how I'm seen. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? I kind of like being a woman, so it's, it's not that bad. You get to wear better clothes. I know that, that sounds a bit wishy-washy, but I don't mean it that way. I mean, we, we don't have to be um, the bloke. Mm. Completely I interrupted you before. What was oh, your no. comment? I was just going to say, look, you see, it, it all depends, and, and Vicky talked about this, what space you want to play in, right? So um, there are lots of women in the multicultural space who are leaders. You yeah. see them represented if anyone watches the drum. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of commentators, and kudos to ABC for starting to show that diversity, right? So... Um, not of LGBTQI only community, but also of Sudanese women, Muslim women, like you see it. They've got Muslim reporters now on, on ABC. So they're paving the way. I have the question for that. Are we too white to be diverse as Greeks? Well, I feel like I am. So, and this oh, is yeah, where we find we're yourself. We're racist in, within our own Yeah, space, we're very ethnic. Right? So. But I, I think I found it in myself when you were talking before, because I'm of that age group where you weren't the trailblazers in the racism, anti-racism um, advocacy and lobby for change, right? Because I came a generation before. But then I'm not, um, you know, a woman of colour or an Asian woman or, you know, identity, like, um, you know, you fit a particular thing. Does is that bother me? No, I have does so it much. Does it bother you? No, no, it doesn't. In fact, I have a very close Greek girlfriend, who's changed her maiden name from a beautiful Greek name to a beautiful non-Greek name, and we've had fierce arguments. She says to me, "You need to change your name from Papa Christos to your husband's name, Peters," and you know, I grew up in my teens and my 20s going, oh my God, I need to get married to get rid of this bloody surname. <laughs> and then one day I had this epiphany and thought, oh my God, I'm multicultural, mm. tick that box. I'm female, <laughs> tick that box. I don't need to be um, and have an Anglo-Saxon surname anymore because I'm comfortable with that and it's accepted, it's desired. Does it mean that I'm going to get those roles? And then getting away from the female uh, diversity, getting into the LGBTIQ, etc. On boards, you can't tell. 
You cannot tell. I'm on a board where the diversity on the board is much more than most boards, but nobody can see it, right? So um, how do you, how do you, and you know, the ASX doesn't measure that because they don't know how and, or they don't, people don't want to talk about it so openly. And so the, the, the um, quotas that are being called on are really important and really, like I get asked all the time, do you believe in quotas? And my answer is yes, because unless you have a platform from which to work from and to, you're never going to get there. You are, or you're going to struggle to get there and then it'll get too hard. And one of the things is a lot of women opt out. Part of the reason they're not still in the C-suite or going to the C-suite is because they're tired of pushing that barrel. And they go, you know what, I can do something else that's a lot more interesting. And so some of the more successful startups we've worked, we've seen and worked on are much more mature women who have worked really hard. They know how to run businesses, they know what to do, and now they're doing it for themselves. So it's quite, it's a whole other conversation. And things are changing. In terms of name change, I've had a lot of women in the network that have had to change their name. One of them is a pilot. When she applied, um, this is a long time ago, she sent two resumes, one with her Greek name and the other one with mm. an Anglo name, exactly the same, and she got recruited with an Anglo name. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but these days, a lot of people you know, are very proud of, of their identity, and especially in the Greek, in my, if I'm reflecting back now 20 years down the track since I've founded Food for Thought Network, I think it's cool to be Greek today. A lot of <laughs> Greek women are really proud of their identity and, and they're really, really good. When the revolution happened, most of the men, they were away. So the women, they had the opportunity to show leadership. And I believe it still continue to be the same. Um, Around the world. Yes, and, and here is the same and everywhere, because the tradition or what we learn is that the leader is the man. And slow, slowly, slowly, we had to change that. And it still need a lot of work, but it's happening. What, uh, what, what, what was it like in Cyprus? In Cyprus, what I know is that after 1955, after... Um, the British. Yes, group. the British. Um, revolution in Cyprus, a lot of Cypriot women uh, managed to do a lot of things and show a, lot, a big leadership. And after that, they started to go to schools and be more educated. And um, it was like they had the opportunity to show what they can do. I think around the world, even for the people that they came here in Australia as uh, for a better life, they were looking for opportunities. So I think it's a very important word. And when we have the opportunity, how many times we heard from men that I never thought that I would do this heroic thing. But the house was burning, so I had to go and, and suddenly he became a hero because he had the opportunity to show the leadership. So my background, I'm an architect and I've been working as a project manager for maybe 25 years. So I deliver large community buildings and I work in, a, in an environment where it's mainly men. And what I have learnt to do is to celebrate my successes and to be very vocal of my successes. So when I deliver a good project, I don't sit back. I say, this is what I have done and this is what we have all done together collaboratively. Growing up with a very strong Greek woman and two strong Greek sisters, mm. that was my life. So hearing about the, uh, the oppression and striving for success was the norm for me. So listening to Vera speaking about your, um, your uh, interactions with other women or hearing about the way you are dealt with or how you deal with men in the boardrooms, it really makes me want to shrink back and go, how have I contributed to that behaviour and what have I done to change that behaviour? I'm an educator at the moment working with our schools of intellectually disabled students and my goal is to make those girls 
strive for success and make the boys support them. Because I think the only way for women to have an equal vo voice in the, in the industries they choose is for the boys to support them. So it's now very gender equal, gender balanced, because you shouldn't, you sh your success shouldn't be based on your sexuality or your um, gender identity. There's a male growing up with two very strong sisters. I support that. I have a very different experience regarding women like, like uh, women that they allowed because I grew up in Greece and my mother was not, was equal voice, yeah. had an equal voice to other women. So she didn't have, so I think that the experience of women here in Australia is like, they have to, they are women, but also they come from a multicultural background. And actually this is their identity and this is how it produces and this is how it manifested to being a loud and strong women. I think most women that I've met here in the Greek community they are very, very strong uh, and they don't, and they're not afraid to voice their opinions. However, in Greece, and it goes back to the monocultural, like uh, this is, and this is what I didn't like in Greece, that it's very monocultural. It's slightly, slowly changing. It's though. slowly, yeah. The last, I've I haven't been to, in Greece for 10 years, so it's slowly changing. Yeah, the Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but I think that in Greece, the other problem we had, it was like, we never, so my mother was the one that was cooking, was uh, cleaning, doing everything. And, and with the boys, because we were two boys, it, de it never occurred to us that we had to do some of these things because my mother never asked for. So when I came to Australia and okay, I'm married, of course it's half-half. <laughs> Maybe 60-40 if, uh, if my <laughs> wife, yes, if my wife uh, like has to do some studying or anything. And that's what I want to pass to my daughters as well. Like, it's not like you have to do everything. You have to do your fair share, being in a woman, uh, being uh, in a family, and actually being a mother and a wife. I guess I grew up in a household where my father did all the um, cooking and cleaning, so it was really, I wasn't really exposed to that interpretation that you're a female, so therefore you're very limited. And I've really taken on that ph philosophy, I'm an academic, and with my and I really do, I guess, interpret and apply a really inclusive pedagogy for my students. I thought about money and I thought, because we were talking about the women from the revolution, most of them that were successful or are known had a lot of money. And I have those conversations with a lot of the young women. I say to them, you need to make money because that gives you freedom to make changes and to push the world in a different way, in a positive way. So I say to them, go and find out what all the guys are earning at work. And if you're not earning as much as them in your category, then you need to go and get a pay rise. And I'll come and talk to me about how to get a pay rise and we'll work through that. And their anxiety, just with that simple conversation is intense. So how do you change that and keep moving forward, getting the um, oppression of being grateful for having a job where you're doing as much, if not better, than the bloke next to you, and they're getting paid more than you, and you're okay with that is not okay with me. I think it's great to have the opportunity to be with people that, um, you know, some that you know, some that you don't, to exchange ideas and to understand the world a little bit differently. You know, I've been thinking that um, maybe things would have been different if Bubulina and Mavrogenus had an incubator or they had media. However, they had art. About art, we'll talk in our next episode next week. See you soon. Kalinikta. They had this, you know, really fabricated, concepted notion of the grief of a long, long time ago that they had to come in and save. So art drove them to revolution and to war. I can't think any way that any piece of art could be easily communicated throughout Greece at that time. And it wasn't until many years later that I looked at folk art and what art represented amongst the people that um, my ideas of heroism changed. And the only reason I've seen any art about the 1821 revolution is because I went to Greek school and it got shoved down my throat. Art empowers people. Art makes the courage rise, you know, into our hearts and, 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 and inspires us to act. Art makes the, you know, the tears well in our eyes and the laughter, you know, uh, dance in our, in our bellies. <laughs>